birds of a feather flock together. It sounds like some of y'all have heard that saying before. It means that people who are alike tend to gravitate towards each other because you have something in common, common traits or common likes, birds of a feather flock together. Closed mouths don't get fed. Look at y'all. That saying means that if you don't speak up for what you need or what you want, you are more than likely not going to receive it. Closed mouths don't get fed. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I see some confused looks on some people's faces like, what is that? <laughs> a bird in one hand is better than two birds that you see in a bush. Because the saying is, means is that it is better to be content with what you have than to risk losing everything by seeking more. Got to let go of the bird in one hand to catch the other two. And if you do that, you're liable to miss all three. You never miss your water till your well runs dry. That, that saying means that we <coughs> have, a <ten> <coughs> excuse me, have a tendency to fail to realize what we have before us in good people and good things, that is, until they are gone. You never miss your water until your well runs dry. Now, I'm sure if I pass the microphone around in the room, there will be some of you that could add more sayings to my short list. Today, I want us to look at another saying that is divinely inspired, it comes from God himself. And it is found in this section of Proverbs that is called the sayings of the wise, which is comprised of 30 sayings. It is the last one that I want to call your attention to is in Proverbs chapter 24, verses 21 through 22. <coughs> Before we jump in, allow me to mention a few things to help us understand how we need to approach and understand the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs along with Job, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, are categorized as wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. So it is best to be read, or that is to read the book of Proverbs with these other books in mind. So if you read Proverbs, it's good to also consider the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. Because those two books in particular introduce realities, Kevin, to, that help us to temper our tendency to take proverbial material too far. We'll hear a proverb and we will take it in many cases as an ironclad promise from God, not realizing that he's also given other revelation and other books that help to temper that. From happening. So when we read Proverbs, we need to keep the book of Job in mind because it reminds us that living a life of wisdom doesn't necessarily exclude us from suffering. Are y'all in here with me? Because bad things can and do happen to people who live righteously. Job was righteous in his generation is what the scripture says. And yet Job lost family. Job lost possession. Job lost his health. Job lost his children. So we need to read the book of Proverbs with the book of Job in mind. I mean, let's, let's be honest. The, the book of Proverbs tells us that in Proverbs chapter 3 that we need to, for example, honor the Lord with our wealth. And with the first fruits of our produce, and the Bible says that when we do that, when we honor the Lord with our wealth, when we give to the Lord, to the local church, specifically in our context, in our day and time, 
And when we honor him in that way, when we give tithes or offerings to the local church in God's honor, the, the Bible says when we honor the Lord with our wealth, when we steward it the way he wants us to steward it, when we are generous the way he wants us to be generous with it, that our, the Bible says, our vats will be bursting with wine and our barns will be filled with plenty. But I, I would venture to say that there's some people in this room, like me, who you have faithfully given to the Lord and yet still found yourself unemployed. No, <laughs> I know there's some people in the room who have faithfully given to the Lord. You are committed to giving tithes and offerings. You're committed to supporting the local church in his honor, giving a portion of your finances, being generous, stewarding your money. And yet you find yourself in certain seasons living from hand to mouth. Or barely making it from paycheck to paycheck. I, I've been there. I don't know if you've been there. I've been there where I, I've been faithfully given to the Lord, financially given to the church, and, and yet and still there have been times where I could not, Michael, go to the ATM with my wife and, and withdraw money from the ATM because, you know, you got to at least have $20 for, in, in this day and time to withdraw money out of your account from the ATM. But it, again... If we only read Proverbs and don't consider Job, we'll come up with this twisted theology that doesn't prepare us for the hardships of life. When we read the book of Proverbs, we need to keep the book of Ecclesiastes in mind because it reminds us that the accoutrements, the, the accessories, the trappings that come along oftentimes with wise living, like money sometimes, influence, possessions, power, and when you live a wise life, oftentimes those are the outcomes, not all the time, but usually. Reading the book of Ecclesiastes, Jamil, reminds us that those things, those accoutrements in and of themselves cannot provide us ultimate satisfaction and meaning. And so we don't need to make gods of those things. We don't need to pursue those things in and of themselves because they will leave us heavily empty in the end. Proverbs, give you a few more points and then we'll jump into our text. Proverbs, here's a, a point for you on the screen. They are, they are written to be memorable, but they are not comprehensive. That is, they, they don't consider every or cover every possible scenario. Here's another one. The book of Proverbs gives general principles and precepts, not so much absolute promises. If we follow the Proverbs, if you follow the book of Proverbs, the outcomes that the Proverbs speak about will more than likely happen. But there are exceptions. Are y'all in here? So you have to be careful because there, are, there have been times where people have taught things from the book of Proverbs. You may have heard sermons from the book of Proverbs and they treat Proverbs as if it, it will, this is a promise from God. And then when you live this thing out and realize that the outcome is not always one to one. There's not always a one to one correlation between doing what the proverb says and the outcome of that proverb. It's because people are making the mistake of not understanding that Proverbs as a genre, as a wisdom book, only gives general principles and precepts, not absolute promises. Many other Proverbs, here's another one, are self-explanatory. Y'all hungry? Okay, because I'm not used to y'all being this quiet. Y'all processing? Okay, all right. You processing. Proverbs 15 and 1. Let's, let me give you an example. Proverbs 15 and 1 says this. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Listen, that, that ain't even the message for the day. That ain't even the, the, the text for the day, but that's a word for somebody. <laughs> a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It's self-explanatory. A soft, a soft response. Meaning soft, meaning gentle in tone and content. Woo! 
Generally speaking, you've seen this played out. When you have had somebody who comes and they are, they, they are, man, they, they, they are, are, you have a contention or there's some tension that's going on. And, and, and instead of you escalating it, you give a gentle response and usually it'll de-escalate things. At the very least, it won't stir up, the scripture says, continue to stir the pot and cause that person to get angry. Mm -hmm. But how many of y'all have been there too where you've given a harsh word, a harsh response? Yep. And it caused things to get worse. Here's another one. Here's another example of being self-explanatory. Proverbs 15, verse 18. A hot-tempered person, man or woman, stirs up strife. But he or she who is slow to anger quiets contention. That's another word for somebody. It's for all of us, really. A hot-tempered man or woman stirs up strife. Somebody that is easily angered, got anger issues. They'll stir up stuff. Even when there is no stuff. <laughs> right? Or there is stuff that's a one, but they take it to a ten. But the one who is wise, the one who is slow to anger, tries the quiet contention. That their wise person doesn't try to get into verbal altercations. The wise person doesn't Try to stir up contention or exacerbate it or make it worse. So Proverbs are self-explanatory. And here's the last one. Proverbs are meant to be practiced, not simply parroted. You know, because... Just how we did in the beginning. I'm not saying you were parroting it, but it can get to that point to where we just... We just say why I say it's just to say it because it sounds cute or it sounds manly or womanly or whatever. It just sounds good. And so we just get to a point like a parrot. A parrot don't live the stuff that that parrot is repeating. Right? The parrot just repeats. But Proverbs are meant to be lived out, not just memorized and quoted and just simply known. We got to put this stuff into practice. And now that we have a general understanding of the book of Proverbs, let's dig into our text today. See what God has to say to us. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. The writer in Proverbs chapter 24, at the top of verse 21, he gives a two-part positive command. Then verse 21, the first part. Of verse 21. The first part of the positive command is that we need to fear the Lord. Do y'all see that in your Bible? My son, you can put my daughter there, but my son is usually, uh, uh, Proverbs is oftentimes given, to, you know, in case in, the, in, the, in a father-son relationship, but it can be applied uh, to women and daughters as well. So just understand that that means you and me. It says, my son, fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord. To fear means to show high honor and status to one who is in authority. To say it another way, the writer directs us, here it is, to respect divine authority. We are to live our lives in high regard for God. So living a wise life begins with fearing God. If you want to be wise, fear God. Respect God. Have high regard for God above anything and anyone else, including yourself. 
I, I, want, I need to pause right there. I feel like the Holy Spirit needs to pause right there. He wa- right there. Because most of us don't have a problem amening when we say you need to fear God above everybody else. Your mama, your daddy, your aunt, your uncle, your kids, your boss, every, your neighbor, right, right? Fear God above them. They ain't your God. Amen. And then we say that includes yourself. Because oftentimes we make ourselves a God. Our feelings a God. My thoughts a God. My own opinions God. How I feel, what's going on with me, my heart, my desires can become God. You need to fear God. We need to fear God even above our own selves. Amen. Fear God. Proverbs 1 verse 7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So, so here, here, here's, here's a question and the answer for you. What does fearing the Lord look like? It looks like believing his truth and obeying his commands. What does fearing the Lord look like? Uh, What does us fearing the Lord look like? It looks like believing his truth and obeying his commands. Psalm 119, 160 declares this. This is on the screen for you. The sum, that is the whole, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. What does it look like to fear God? It looks like us believing God's truth. That is the Bible. So we believe the Bible. Here's what, here's what we believe. We believe what God says about himself in this book is true. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. repent. We believe it. The Bible says God is righteous in all his ways. We believe it. (laughs) The Bible says God is perfect, that there is no darkness in him. There's no sin in him at all. We believe it. The Bible says Jesus is the Savior, not a Savior, the one and only Savior of the world. We believe it. The Bible says there is One God and only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many. We believe it. The Bible says Jesus is God. We believe it. The Bible says that Jesus existed eternally alongside the Father and the Spirit that he was not created. We believe it. The Bible says that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that person, that name is Jesus. We believe it. No other name. No other religion. Because the Bible says Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, the Bible says, is the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe it because fearing God calls for us to believe his truth. Don't tell me that you fear God and you don't believe his truth. Because you can say we fear God, but what do you believe? Because when the Bible says it, if you don't believe it, that says you don't fear God. You don't. And people who may be of other religions that say they fear God, if they don't believe what this Bible says, they don't fear God. Because they're not believing what he has revealed to us himself. Amen. I mean, I mean, I mean, if somebody did that with you. Somebody says, I, you know, I fear you, I, I respect you, but then when you say something, they don't believe it. Are they really respecting you? 
They're not respecting you. They don't really believe you. They don't really, they don't really trust you because they don't believe what you say. They say they honor you. You're a trustworthy person. You're a man, a woman of your word. But when you say something, they don't believe it. They're saying one thing, but they're living another thing. If we fear God, we believe what God says about himself in this book. Here's the second thing. Fear of God means we believe God, we believe his truth, means that what God says about us in this book is true. <laughs> so the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We believe it. The Bible says God created us. We believe it. The Bible doesn't say we are descendants of some ape-like or ape-human common ancestor. That's evolution. The Bible says God is the one who created us. And our common human ancestor wasn't some ape-like ape-human. It was Adam and Eve. That's who we descended from. The Bible says it. We believe it <laughs> because we fear God. And people can call you whatever they want to call you because people will call you. They will call you a religious, you know, you just a religious fanatic. Y'all are just you're so illogical. You're irrational. Y'all Christians or whatever. They can say whatever they want because we fear God more than them. And if God said it, we believe it. If it's in this book, we believe it. The Bible says also that we as humans are sinners. <laughs> we, we are by nature children of wrath. We are born natural, natural born sinners. The world says, y'all, we good. We are inherently good. There's nothing really wrong with us. We just make bad decisions occasionally, but we're not sinners. The Bible says the opposite. So whatever, if we fear God, what the Bible says that God says about us, we believe it. Regardless if the culture is going opposite of it. So, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm going here, and the only reason I'm going here, this is not a, hop, a, a hobby horse for me, is because it's just so large in culture. So, so when God says he created us male and female, and there's only two genders, we believe it. And yes, Lord. The Bible says that there's only one type of marriage that God instituted. It is between one man and one woman. We believe it. The God, God says that he wants heterosexual monogamous marriages, that there's only supposed to be one man and one woman, and sex is supposed to only be uh, experienced in that context. We believe it. We believe it. Hear me. Even though at times we may fail in living it, doesn't change the fact that God said it. It's still his standard. It's still his standard. What God says about us is true. And if we fear him, we'll believe it. Here's the second thing. We not only believe his truth, we obey his commands. The Bible says that God's commands are not burdensome. That his law is perfect and pure. And it benefits us. Okay, come on, y'all, come on. Put your, put, your, put your theological hats on with me. Put your Bible hats on with me. Think about Exodus 20. Think about, think about the Ten Commandments that God gave. Who do they benefit? They don't benefit God because God is self-existent. God is within himself. He is Perfectly complete. He, he doesn't need to be improved upon. There, there is nothing that benefits him because he is a benefit to himself all by himself. There, there's nothing that, that he needs to benefit from in the sense that we benefit from. It, those, those commandments are a benefit to us. Think about it. The scripture in Exodus 20 says don't murder. Whose good is that for? 
is our, for our good. And if we fear God, we'll obey it. Watch it. So if we obey what God says, then humans don't storm into a, a Russian concert hall and murder innocent men, women, and children. Y'all do know that happened this weekend. When we don't obey God's commands, we are the ones who suffer for it. When we acknowledge God's command to not murder, then we don't randomly attack people on the street. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't do things like walk up in certain communities and a certain, you know, up to certain Asians and hit them in the face and knock them out cold and cause them to, some people cause them to die or be in an incapacitated state all because there's something we got going on, racial hate that we got going on against them. When we, when we fear God, we obey his commands, and his commands are good for us. When we obey God and fear him, and he says don't murder, and we, we don't commit violence against each other unnecessarily, unjustifiably, then we don't have kids that's walking around filming other kids, pummeling, pummeling you know, beating kids' heads into the concrete, and nobody stops it. But you got enough, enough God doggone just craziness to take your phone out and to film everything is going rather than calling the police, calling an authority or trying to step in and pull somebody off of somebody before somebody gets seriously hurt or dies from it. When we fear God, we obey his commands because his commands are good for us. Scripture says we don't steal to not steal. <laughs> Anybody ever had anything stolen from you? This wouldn't be an issue if, if we fear God and left people's stuff alone. If it's not yours, don't take it. We should be able to live in a world, but because we're all sinners, that's why we lock our cars. That's why, we don't, that's why we don't leave our purses and wallets and cell phones in our cars when we go in our, in our homes or in apartments at night. Some of us accidentally did it, came out, window busted, car door open, stuff gone. If we fear God, we obey his commands because his commands are good for us. We don't steal other people's stuff. Stealing identity. Stealing your debit card. I saw a video the other day, Cheryl, of, of some young, young guy at, at some fast food restaurant, and, and he got his phone out. Just just. I can say it because the Bible says just dumb, foolish, what the Bible says. Got his phone out on the counter, recording himself, and he got people's debit card that they handed to him in the window to pay for their fast food, and he's taking pictures of they. Now, he's recording himself taking pictures and stealing people's debit card numbers and credit card numbers. If we fear God, we obey his commands because his commands are for our benefit. Now, now somebody that stole your ID, now you got to call the bank or go online and tell them to close down the card, shut the card down, and got to go here and make sure no transactions and got to do a dispute and file a claim. And, re you know, this say, you know they didn't got $700 at the liquor store down here and then went over here, right? They didn't first tested it and did $5 over here and got a pack of gum, then ran over here and got Walmart and went grocery shopping and put $1,000 out of your account. 
Stealing. Stealing people's identity. Stealing, stealing. Here it is. Not only stealing people's stuff, stealing people. We wouldn't have human trafficking. Y'all, if, 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 if we would fear God and obey his commands and realize his commands are good for us. You know, there used to be a time, most of us in my generation or maybe older generations, we used to be able to go outside. I remember we used to be able to ride our bikes and walk for miles by ourselves with our friends. Y'all remember this? Yeah. On your bike, just going. Uh -huh. Where we going? Boop, boop, boop. We going seven miles down the street. We going down ravines in the woods, Michael. We going everywhere where there's trees and wooded areas, and we just we just having fun doing but you know wheelies, everything. You know, I mean, we just having fun sliding and doing all this stuff. Walking if you walking with your girls or whatever, y'all riding your bikes, riding skateboards. We just going everywhere, man. Everywhere and didn't have a worry in the world about somebody pulling up in white vans or vehicles or trying to kidnap us. Now, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but back in the day, it didn't happen as much. But now, you can't even let your child go into a restroom by themselves without fear of some man or woman, right? That's in there, hiding in, 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 a, in, a, in a stall somewhere. Y'all remember what happened to that young girl when she was at the football, Dallas Cowboys game? I think it was Dallas Cowboys with her father at the AT&T Stadium. Went to the restroom by herself, thousands of people around. And somebody, somebody kidnapped her. And walked her straight up out of the stadium. Was headed, I think, to Oklahoma on their way somewhere to New Mexico. I mean, Mexico. It was, they were gone somewhere. They were headed out of state. Thank God the local, the local authorities were able to catch him before he did. But there are countless of men and women, boys, children. Now, we ain't, talking, we ain't not talking about something bygone years ago who have been kidnapped. In somebody's basement somewhere, man, chained up, doing God knows what to them. Because we don't fear God or his commands. And, and let alone, we go back transatlantic slave trade. and all, all, It's man stealing. It's people stealing. God's commands are good for us. Therefore, our benefit. Here's the second part of the positive command. I love the Bible. I know you do too. Is we need to, you see it there? It's verse 21. My son, fear the Lord. Read the Bible for yourself. And what? The king. Here's your point. We need to respect human authority. For them, it was the king. Fearing the Lord involves respecting and obeying human authority. Now, hear me well. This human authority does not have absolute authority. The Bible doesn't call us to do absolute submission and obedience where, you know, human authority is absolute authority and whatever they tell you, good or bad, you got to do it. No, no. Human authority needs to be ethical authority. In other words... Human authority that is within the boundaries of God's word and his rules and his regulations, the Bible says we need to respect human authority when that human authority is in line with the scripture, right? And even if that human authority is operating outside of that scripture, if they are not commanding us to do something sinful, there is still a respect and a deference that should be there. Y'all think about this, think about it, because the Roman, the Roman government, the Roman emperor was not saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> there were so many political leaders and governing leaders in, that, in the church's day, right? Even the kings in, in the Old Testament that were wicked. And yet there, there, is a, there is a common decency, common respect that God expects us to give to people who are in authority. 
So let me give you some examples. Respecting human authority looks like respecting, respecting governing authority. Romans 13 and 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Federal government, state government, local government, civil authority. Uh-huh. Police officers. Firemen and firewomen. EMTs, EMS. Are y'all... Uh huh. Cause some of some of us some some of us walk around here, and 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 we not we not respecting governing authorities. And I get y'all. I get it. I mean, we ain't going down this whole thing. We know that there are bad apples in every bunch. That that's not that's not what we're talking about. But but if they're governing authority. We need to respect them. So we got a dear, we got a dear member of our church who's a part of this group of governing authority. And if something jump off, like if somebody, like if something happened, like right outside of these doors in the parking lot, right? And I, and I, and we know our members, you know, this person is not necessarily in uniform, but let's just hypothetically say that this member was in uniform one day, on duty. What came out and patrolled the parking lot, some broke out in the parking lot, and we in the middle of church, right, or leaving church, we dismiss, and our dear member comes up to the door and says, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an altercation going on outside that we're dealing with. It's a dangerous altercation. I need y'all to stay in the building. You know what we need to do? Go, go, go take ourselves Back inside and sit in these blue chairs and, and get on the phone and wait. Order some DoorDash, I don't know, and just wait. <laughs> what we don't do, y'all, is be like, will you, what? And then use the member's name, move out the way. I need to go. I got beans on the kitchen, in the, on the stove. <laughs> No, they just going to burn. They just going to burn because respect and authority says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, turn around, sit down somewhere. Sit down. So when, when, when a police officer, another example, puts their lights on behind you, you don't say, I ain't done nothing wrong. I'm just going to keep on driving. No. And if it's dark, my dad used to tell me this, if it's dark, then you, you, you wave at the police officer or somebody, you call somebody on the phone, you call 911, you say, I realize there's a police officer behind me, I'm not running. I, could you please inform him that it's dark and can we please pull over in the light? And they, normally they're going to do it anyway. But you don't, just, you don't just take matters into your own hands and disrespect authority and just be like, you know, I saw your lights, but I didn't know you were coming after me. He was right behind you. <laughs> she, he even got on the intercom. They didn't got on the last speaker, you know, and I pull over. And, and you're like, he ain't talking to me? Yes, he is. <laughs> pull over. He's governing authority. You walk up into a, a governmental meeting and the mayor's presiding or the city council's doing something and they tell you to please, you know, silence your phones and please don't make outbursts. That we, we got remarks here. You need to submit your remarks online and you can then be acknowledged and come up and speak. You don't just walk up to the podium. I'm a, pay, I'm a taxpayer citizen. I, you know, I can, I can speak when I dog on get well and ready. No. That's disrespecting Authority. There's governing authority. There's parental authority. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, listen up, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's right. <laughs> They're going to clap for that one. 
They didn't clap for the governing authority, but they clap for that parental authority because I got kids. Y'all hear this? <laughs> All right, children. Right? This, this applies to uh, even those of us, right? The only time I remember my dad telling me, listen, as long as you in this house, you're going to abide by my rules. Now, when you get your own place, you can make your own rules. But as long as you lay in it, and, that, and, and listen, that meant the same when we were 10 and when we were 20 if we moved back into the house. That's why someone's like, I ain't moving back in. I can't do that. I can't do that because I know once I move in, <laughs> the rules apply, right? So, but it applies, man, because watch this. If you had kids, you're going you to expect the same thing. Yep. It's parental authority that we need to respect. Again, remember, this is not absolute authority. A parents telling us to do something sinful, you obey God instead of your parents, but you get the point. Here's the next one. is occupational authority. I don't have time to give you the scripture reference. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. I don't have time to read it, but it talks about bond service, obeying your earthly masters. This, this is not, don't, don't read slavery in the New Testament as transatlantic slavery. It's, it was indentured servitude. Right? It wasn't man stealing. That, that, that wasn't necessarily the case, the predominant case in the New Testament. So that's why people use the parallel of working like for an employer. Or a boss. It's you got we gotta we have to respect authority. That means the person you work for. I got well, I got more certifications than they do. I got more experience than they do. I got I got more degrees than they do. I got more common sense than they do. Okay. You might, but they in the position. Mm-hmm. You got to respect your body. Well, they ain't a believer. So? They're in a position and need to be respected as such. They told you to get the project done at a certain time. You need to get the project. They told you to come to the meeting. You need to come to the meeting. They told you that you need to, you know, watch out, you know, do some performance improvement plan, X, Y, and Z, and it's all legitimate. And we know people can mistreat you, and we know people can do things. You got, you got different um, uh, leeways to handle that, right? You got different protocols to handle that. You can go above them. You can appeal to higher authority, whatever. But I'm saying if, if they are leading correctly and leading within the bounds of the country and within the employee handbook. You respect it. You got to submit to it. Well, Pastor, you, 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 you. <laughs> come, come, come work, come to work with me one day. Take, come, come and see if you can, if you can do that. Well, here's the thing. We live in a, in a free country. Hey, thank the Lord. Go find you another job then. No, seriously. If, if you if you having that much problem submitting to that authority, then you request a transfer, something. Pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, get me out. Make a way, Jesus, out of no way. <laughs> right? Then leave. Resign, because watch this, it's better for you and for your health and for your spiritual health and your mental health. Some of us, now if God is saying that he's blocking every door, then apparently that's a mission field, that's somebody that God wants you to be a witness to, and that's, that's a, a means that he's using to provide for you, so then you just got to count it off joy. <laughs> count it off joy. Y'all are y'all here with me? Count it off joy. When you fall into, into all kind of hardships and you work in a hostile environment and it's hard, I get it, but the Lord is using that to grow you spiritually somehow. But submit and keep applying for jobs. You can still do the, You can do both. All right? All right, here's the next one. Here's the last one. Pastoral or church leader authority. What? Is that in the Bible? <laughs> yes, it is. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. 
so that they can do this with joy and not with groaning. But this would be unprofitable for you. I'm going to read that again. O obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with groaning. For this will be unprofitable for you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, who, who, or who the writer of Hebrews has in mind here is not just, it's pastors, but it's also church leaders. It's leadership overall. Right? Um, now, let me give a caveat, because I know some of us thinking about, you know, well, there's abusive pastors, and yes, there are. But hear me, as our pastoral authority comes within the boundaries of this Bible. This is not, this is not some carte blanche you know, card that God's giving pastors to be like telling you, uh, you know, I need you to come and wash my car. Kevin, when I walk up in here, I need you to take my ESV Bible in under your arm and get a handkerchief and grab that water bottle and follow me in here. And when I sweat, you bring that rag up here and you wipe that sweat off. <laughs> that, that, that's abuse. That, that's, 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 that's not legit. That's, that's not legit. Now, it's different if somebody just volunteers to do that stuff, but a humble leader would be like, I can carry my own Bible. Y'all ever notice I ain't had Kevin to carry my Bible? I ain't had Chris to carry my Bible up here. Y'all notice I ain't had Michael or, or one of the sisters be like, sit on the front row, and when I get up, I don't have my Bible with me. I just stand up, and then they come up, and then they put the Bible, and then they open it to my passage, and they put the notes down, then they, un, you know, they untwist the cap on the bottle of water, and then they put my grapes here and my goblet down there. <laughs> Woo! Lord Jesus, some foolishness. Y'all know some of this stuff be going on under the guise of pastoral. No, man. No, no, no. But, but as long as we lead in according to this, and we come in, for example, and we bring in love and correction to you, and we saying, hey, sis, bro, look, this, this, is, what this, this is what the Bible says says that you don't need to have this type of attitude or, you, or, or you're committing a sin and we lovingly say, hey, remember, encourage you, hey, we need to be confessing that and trying to strive against that. Or the Bible says you need to be loving and kind and we come and we say, hey, bro, sis, hey, we're going to be praying for you. I know it's tough, but you got to treat that boss with respect and kindness. Scripture says obey, submit, willingly comply is what it means there. Hear me, as, as leaders and pastors of here at your church, we are not called to make you submit. That's spiritual abuse. For example, in marriage, in Christian marriages, excuse me, husbands are the head of their wives, and as the head of their wives, we're supposed to be lovingly leading them, serving them like Christ loved and served the church. But nowhere does the scripture call a husband to make their wife submit. The command to submit has been given to the wife herself. It's, for, it's her responsibility out of her devotion and love to her Lord to willingly submit to your loving, humble, Christ-like servant leadership. A leadership that values her as an equal in terms of being equally created in God's image. A, a leadership that values her opinion and her expertise and the fact that she knows how to do accounting and you can't add two plus two together. So why are you over the bank? Why are you over the books? Why are you over the account? Don't make no sense. I don't know why I'm moving like this today, Chris. I just feel it in my spirit. I'm trying to emphasize the people. Danny, where was I going? Okay, so <laughs> just, but we submit. We willingly comply and support your pastors and your church leaders as they lead according to the scriptures. Why is it 
I don't even move this much. It's just, it's, I don't know. Why is it? Why I am, Tamika, why is it that we submit to bosses and we submit to people that may not even know Jesus, that we ain't even really that cool with, that they ain't really got no spiritual investment in our lives, that they not really, they ain't praying for us, they not whatever, right? They, but we, we willingly submit to them. Are we willingly submit to the mayor? Are we willingly submit to city council people? Are we willingly submit, you know, to the CEO? And when he's come, she comes into the room or the CFO steps in the room and we're like, you know, yes, and I respect them and they are wonderful. They're intelligent and they're, they're, you know, they just know their stuff and they're competent. You know, they got, oh, they got all kind of accomplishments and accoutrements and, and respect and influence and platform. And then we get to the church and treat the pastors and the leaders like dirt. Because we get all common with them, you know. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, there's nothing wrong with, I tell people, get common. We, I am common. I'm kind, there ain't nothing special about me. You can call me Ed, that's my name. That's who I am. No, I'm serious. We got, we got members that do that all the time. We got one on our finance team. She, you know, she be, she be texting me, hey, Ed. Like, hey. And I go like, all right, all right. And I'm like, hey, sis. But I don't get sideways with that, because that's, that's who I, that's on my gut, that's, that's what's on my birth certificate. You feel me? I'm not tripping about that. But man, come on. Some of us, though, like we just, yeah, we just disrespectful, man. We just unsubmissive when it comes to pastors and church leaders. And God tells us we need to be supporting them. You know, something wrong if you fight more with your pastors and leaders who are trying to lead according to the scriptures than you do with your boss at your job. You know what we say? Well, the reason why I ain't fighting with my boss is because I need my job. I need my money. So, so now is money your God? Because that's what we're saying. All right, let me, bring, let me run to the ticker tape with this sermon. The writer then moves to issue a negative command, a prohibition in verse 21. Do y'all see it? Do you see it? My son, fear the Lord and the king. Here's the prohibition. And do not join with those who do otherwise. Here's the point. Wise people don't run with rebels. Desiree is running track now, and uh, my wife is ecstatic because she used to run track. Say she used to run track, <clears throat> so she loving it. She loving it. <clears throat> we went to one of her track meets recently, and I, I noticed that uh, she had a teammate. She was running this particular event. And they were running together. And um, I remember telling her one day, I said, baby, I said, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's good. I said, but you got to remember, you know, if your teammate starts lagging behind, you got to run your own race. Yeah. If you fasten her, run your own race, baby. <laughs> right? But she, but she basically was like, yeah, dad, I know that. But we're, we're teammates. And we try to run together, and, and I knew what she was implying with that. What she was implying was they running together because they help each other. They're, they're pacing themselves. They're, they're encouraging each other. Don't run too fast, X, Y, and Z, right? Or, they, you know, or when somebody takes off, it, it, it inspires them to be like, okay, let me catch up with my teammate. Let me, let me not lag behind. I'm tired. I'm getting cramps. But that my teammate is up here, so it encourages me and inspires me to catch up and to do, to do my all, to give, it, to give it all that I have. And what she, in essence, was, and what I observed from that was that who you run with matters. If you run with somebody who is like, they about to, they going to quit, right? Or, or, or especially when it comes to relay races, right? Where you're dependent on who runs with you, right? 
Like, their actions have an effect on you because who you run with matters. So the question is, who you running with? Are you running with rebels? Here's why you don't need to run with rebels. It's, the answer is in verse 22. All right, we're done. For disaster will arise suddenly from them. And who knows the ruin that will come from them both. Here it is. Here it is. Rebels always experience ruin. Did you read, the, read it carefully? For disaster will arise suddenly from them. And who knows the ruin that will come from them both. Watch it. Read the Bible carefully. Did you notice that at the end of, of that, that it talks about disaster rising from them both? Who's the both? It's not, it's, it's not the rebels. The disaster, the ruin is going to come, hear it, from God or human authority or both of them. Read that, read your Bible carefully. That ruin will come from God or human authorities, and sometimes both of them, or God will use human, human authority to bring ruin. Well, you know the last part of verse 22 is a question. Ah, oh, just you see why y'all got to read the Bible with me? Did you notice it was a question? Who knows the ruin that will come from them both? Don't run with rebels because they will always experience ruin. But watch this. You don't need to run with rebels because they don't, you don't know the type of destruction that God will bring to them. Here, here's, here's another way to see it. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. How many of y'all have ever seen, have you ever seen people in a courtroom and they commit the crime and they're before the judge or the jury and they get sentenced and their sentencing takes them by surprise? It's worse, right, than what they anticipated because you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences. This is the reason, brothers and sisters, why we don't need to run with rebels is because rebels always experience calamity. They always experience destruction. They always will experience harm. Watch it. Even if it doesn't happen in time, it will happen before God in eternity. That God, but, but watch it, God has such a way that he will bring, he oftentimes will bring, bring judgment in real time. But you don't know how it's going to come. God will choose how it comes. Sickness, car wrecks, jail, prison, death. It will come to rebels who defy God and defy human authority. Our arms, brothers and sisters, are too short to box with God. With God. Your arms are too short. The box of God, and it is better for you to submit to him and to human authorities that he has placed in our lives rather than to resist and rebel. Because rebels always experience ruin. So there's an eternal ruin that's coming to all those who reject Jesus. It's coming for every one of every person who doesn't believe in Jesus. And there may be somebody here today that we want to extend an invitation for you to escape that eternal ruin that's coming. The only way for you to escape God's just wrath that is to come upon this unbelieving world of people is for you to run to Jesus, fall down at the cross and to trust in Jesus, in his redemptive work. That is, he lived for you. He died on the cross for your sins and he was raised from the dead. And if you do that today, you can have eternal life and eternal safety and eternal home and eternal relationship with God. 
We want to invite you to turn from Christ, or turn from sin rather than turn to Christ today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've been able to spend in your word. We pray, God, that you will touch somebody's heart here who needs to turn from their sin and trust Jesus. Lord, will you convict them by your spirit, help them to see their sinfulness, to see your love for them, that that's the reason why you sent Jesus, was to save them from their sins, to forgive them of their sins, and to bring them back into a right relationship with you. We pray for a Christian that is here who is, maybe they are here for the first time or returning, but they are looking for a church home. Lord, we pray that you will put that on their hearts, Lord, that uh, Harvest Our Church is the place for them that you desire for them to connect with the community that you desire for them to belong to. And there may be a Christian here, Father, who needs to be baptized. They need to go public with their relationship with you. They've never been baptized, underwent believer's baptism. Now that they have placed trust in you, Jesus, and we pray that they will make that decision today. And Lord, we pray you will bless us as we prepare to give. For those of us that are giving in person, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.